so we've um, eventually we finished the uh, um, the con- no, so the expedition to the book. So we've come to one the part of the Sira now where we talk about the delegations. So um, if you look at the if you look at the history books written by many of the scholars when it comes to the Sira, the the year of the delegations isn't necessarily about the delegations that turn up to see Muhammad Sallam after the book. What they've done is that they've collated all of the delegations, all of the different tribes that came to Muhammad Sallam at various different t- times. Normally that kind of start, well, it could have started as early as the seventh year whilst he was a prophet. So what, seventh year while he was in Makkah, so towards the end part of his stage in Makkah, people were coming to him. So what the way the scholars have done is that they, they collaborated all of this. And the idea was so that you get an idea of, first of all, the different types of people that came to him at early stages and later stages and why they came to him for many different reasons. Some were very good, uh, very positive in terms of, you know, going for the fact that they want to become Muslim because of the work that Muhammad has done. And some of them was quite negative as well. The whole point is, is that we never claim that just because Islam is the perfect religion, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind this religion, that every single human being is going to encompass it. It's not going to happen. We know from the Hadith Qudsi when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to, uh, said to Adam al salam when he struck his left shoulder and his right shoulder, and when he struck his right shoulder, it shattered into white pieces, and he struck his left shoulder, it shattered into black pieces. And he said to Adam, do you know what these are? He said, no. He said, everything that is shattered on your left-hand side, which is the black pieces, this is your progeny, your children that are destined to go to hell. And everything on the right, the white pieces, are your children that are destined to go to paradise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge, knows everything that is going to occur. That doesn't mean he has forced that event. He just knows what's going to happen. He doesn't interfere with the way you think and what you do. You have that freedom and you have that choice. So just because the religion is perfect doesn't mean that everyone's going to accept it. There is a lot of arrogance, a lot of ignorance that exists and a lot of pride that comes into people's way. Many people you'll find in these stories are unwilling, are unwilling to give up the dunya to follow the deen. And we do that in many different capacities. It could be as small as when we're at work that we won't sacrifice a meeting uh, to go do our salah or go to Jummah. You know, we will, we will break the rules all the way down to there could be leadership that will not give up their leadership because of the fact that the benefits that they get from their people, from their community, they don't want to leave that position. Their people have put them in that position. They know that if they take Islam as their way of life, that people will reject them and they will lose that power in that position. So there's many different reasons as to why people came to, you know, to, to, to have a, to do this compromise with Muhammad Salam. So we talk about delegations in general, just understand the concept that in general, what happened was up until when Muhammad Salam did the conquest of Makkah, Makkah was the final straw that broke the camel's back effectively because Makkah, everyone, all the Arab tribes were looking at Makkah as the most powerful force and if there was anyone that was going to destroy the Muslims, it would have to be the Quraysh, not even the Jews. The Jews were very powerful instigators. They were very good in planning and funding, but they themselves didn't have the clout and the, and the strength to take on Muhammad Sallam. If anyone had that strength, it was the Quraysh, and not just because them alone, but simply because of the fact that they had the support from all the other tribes. They could attack the Muslims from different angles. So the attitude of the Arabs was, Let's not interfere with what's going to happen until we see what the outcome is going to be between the Quraysh and the Muslims, and then we'll make our decision. So just to cast people's minds back in this, remember that even before the conquest of Makkah, the eye of the Quran was revealed where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Muslims that remember when God's favor and aid came and the conquest 
meaning the conquest of Fatal Makkah, and you saw the people entering in droves. So this is this is a very important lesson for all of us. And I, I'm going to say this right to all of you. You know, you, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa taala give you long, healthy, you know, uh, and a very successful life in terms of your deen, so that Allah taala can give you the greatest victory in the akhirah. Because this is a very few in the in the percentage of the community. There aren't people like this who want to learn about Islam. There aren't people who would take their time out. You are the very small percentage that exists in the world of the Ummah. We are in a very dark age when it comes to Islam. Very much like when we talked about Islam, when Muhammad Sallam took the, 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 the ropes and the reins of being a prophethood, that was considered to be one of the darkest eras in, human, in the human race. There was... Um, I have to hold myself back when I do this seerah because I can't go into the depth of the details of the vile and the disgusting behavior and the attitude of the people there. If you want to really understand how bad it was, you can get an understanding when people would enslave children, enslave women, enslave men, and send them and sell them and do what they as they please. And you will know from the Roman history, Muhammad Sallam came at a time where they could do whatever they want. There was no UN, there was no NATO, there was no police force, there was no official government. You could do as you please. So this is why Allah SWT sent Muhammad Sallam at the darkest era of the human uh, of humankind and the human race so to uplift. And we almost feel like we've we spiraled back into the same position. Yes, we have these artificial governments and rules and systems. If you're smart enough and you can look through them, they're there to ideally protect those who are in power and doesn't really do much for the people underneath that. And you can only see what happens around the world whenever there's war or famine, what happens to those countries when charity organizations that go in there, what do they get up to with those children? What do they get up to with those people? And, you know, and even in terms of these massive organizations that come in and they rape the economy and destroy just and, and they will play with the markets just to destroy you know the, the economy to get gain for themselves so you begin to see we're in that situation and with Muhammad Sallam when he started this dawah in the beginning very few followed him we don't have Muhammad Sallam with us now but Muhammad Sallam reminded us that time will come where there will be an ummah who will be greater than the sahabi in a different perspective, they will be greater than the Sahabi. And they said, why would they be greater than us? He said, because today you have me with you. Today you have with me. So when you feel down, you come to me. When you want answers, you come to me. I will uplift you. I will control you. And you know that Allah directly communicates with me. But when they come, I will not be around. What they will have left is something called faith. And faith is a very slippery thing to hold on to. You've got to have real diamond hands to stick, hold on to that. you really got to have diamond hands to hold on to that. And you can just see from our children today how hard it is to get our children to, to hold on to our deen, let alone the elders. So you, and you know the challenges. Some of you, I, I have, you know, we have our, you know, one-to-one, -one, not one-to-one, -one, but our smaller circles that we do. We've talked about this. It's the difficulty to hold on to Islam. And therefore, you should commend yourself the fact that you are here. And many people will not be here and they choose not to be here. No, I don't mean my class. I mean, in any activities when it comes to the deen. So you are a very, very small percentage of people. And this leads on to this concept where Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, that prior to the conquest of Makkah, Islam was an unpopular religion. To follow Muhammad Sallam was unpopular. It was not the norms of the society. It wasn't the way to go. And if you followed it, people will look at you very, very differently in the lights of what happens in this country and in the world when there's a terrorist attack. It's almost like sisters feel like they have to take their hijab off so they don't get attacked. Muslim men feel like they have to cut, cut their beards off or shave it off so they don't get looked at or they don't get provoked or they don't you know, get treated unjustly. These are the times that we live in. So at that time, it was very unpopular. And those who followed Muhammad Sallam were the people of true faith. They understood what the message was. They grasped it. They practiced it. They learned it. They memorized it. And they implemented it regardless of what came around them. And their, and their, their reality as a human being, the Akhirah was more real to them than this dunya. And that's a really hard thing to make happen. 
So when Allah Ta'ala says prior to that, they were the they were the elite. They were the elite. Because after that, when the conquest of Makkah came, hundreds and thousands of them came. Then it wasn't so then it wasn't so uh, uh, big of a challenge or a problem because the popularity of Islam grew. And even if you are a monophic, not a problem. No one would know that you are monophic. You know, if you were half convinced by Islam, nobody really cared, right? So people would just, just came in droves. And a lot of people joined Islam because of the economic benefits. A lot of them joined because of the other benefits that they would get from that. But the true believers are those when there's no benefit in this dunya, you choose it because it is the true religion and you want something greater in the akhirah. And that is a real big thing. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in the ayah of the Quran, then he went on to say, then he went on to say that, not equal among you are those who spent before the conquest and they did battle and those who did not. They are higher in rank than those who spent and did battle only later. And to Allah, is promise, it promises all good. And this is in Surah Al-Hadid. So here Allah Ta'ala is saying that those people who made those, those sacrifices, who really put themselves through before the conquest, they will be judged very, very differently. And I really see that we're kind of like in that situation now. Right. So for you people that turn up and you want to learn and you want to do this and you sacrifice your time and your effort, Allah Ta'ala will judge you accordingly. Allah, judge, Allah will give you that reward, you know, in, in such a manner that is deserving of the sacrifices that you make. And that's why I give advice to everyone. you got time on your hands, do more. It's one thing to listen, but propagate, learn, develop yourself. Time is very, very short. You know, only a few, you know, a while back, you know, our young son, Abdul Aziz, you know, he, who, who got stabbed and, you know, passed away and left his dunya. You know, he never did he think that after Ramadan that he would not be able to see even, the, let alone the next Ramadan, the Eid that was going to that was going to come. So, you know, you have to think now. You know, death is not prejudice. Death doesn't pick just the old because they think that's the most easy candidate. It goes for anyone. It it's, it's, it it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't pick right uh, based upon race and color and creed and age. It just whenever Allah Taala decides that, that will happen. So the first story I want to cover when it comes to the delegations that remember uh, that before I start this, uh, this story, that many of the people, they wanted to wait and see what was going to happen. And so the people would say that leave Muhammad for his own people to take care of him. If he does not overcome, meaning the Quraysh, then he will be, if he does, sorry, if he does overcome them, then it's a proof that he's a prophet. And then we will, then we will follow him. So a lot of them just wanted to see. It's like saying tomorrow, if there was an Islamic state and Islam was established and became a very powerful country and a very powerful state, became very rich and everything. Oh, then all of a sudden everybody wants to become Muslims and go to that country and start, you know, following Islam. It's like, you know, Dubai is almost like that false impression. Oh, we love going there because it's an Islamic country. The food is halal. It's got these, you know, the masjids there, whatever. Far from it, right? But you can see the the easy pickings that people take, right? Easy picking that people take. Actually, the true warriors of Islam, the true da'i of Islam, were the people, the Sahabi, who didn't live under the Islamic State. They traveled outside the state as trades people, giving da'wah in, in very unfavorable environments. And they went there and they met there. They were the, they, they were the real soldiers, the real da'is of Islam. So this story talks about the Banu Abdul Qais. And they were a tribe that came to see Muhammad Sallam. Now, you got to remember that Muhammad Sallam, the da'wah that he was doing was so impressive and the concepts that he passed through was spreading like wildfire through Arabia. Whether you liked it, you did not like it. People knew about it. And this is one thing that needs to happen in this country, as well as Europe and America and so forth. The problem is that we don't have knowledge. And because we don't have that knowledge, we don't know what we're saying. And when we talk to non-Muslims, we can say the wrong things and therefore the wrong information goes round about us. That's why Allah SWT will hold us accountable to learn and study about Islam. So when you talk to your friends, when you talk to your colleagues, you've got to make sure you know what you're talking about and you can back it up because he will take on, he or she will take on what you have told them. And they will take that on as that is the view of Islam. 
So what Muhammad Sallam had done when he gave this da'wah, when he prepared the Sahabi, every da'wah they'd done, that message got around to people and people had already picked up. So when the delegations came to see Muhammad Sallam, they didn't say just say to Muhammad Sallam, can you teach us about Islam? They will come to Muhammad and say, we heard that this is what Islam says. Can you confirm? And he would confirm. And just based upon that confirmation, they would become Muslims. So these are the things that are, are, are key in what we do. So this tribe, Banu Abdul Qais, they came to see Muhammad Sallam. And they, when they came, Muhammad Sallam welcomed them because, so the way Muhammad Sallam done it in Medina, when in, in the ninth Hijrah, this is when many of the delegations came, even though many of these stories are from before and afterwards, but majority came after uh, on the ninth of Hijrah. So this is after the book, why? Because he's conquered Makkah, people have now realized there's no way out. He's now going to spread Islam and we have to be in negotiations with him. So we either become Muslim or we stay as we are and we have peace treaty with him, okay? So later on, just after this event, we will talk about next week, inshallah, or whatever the next class is gonna be, that they, uh, when Muhammad Sallam sends Abu Bakr Siddiq and Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu to Makkah, then the ayah of the Quran that comes that forbids the polytheists to come into Makkah. They cannot now do the Hajj, they can't do anything. As a matter of fact, not just that, the polytheists were banned from that Arabia. So either they become Muslims or they're gone. So at the moment, there's a little bit of sway here. So people now thinking how they're going to do this. So this Banu Allah Abdul Qais, when they came to see Muhammad Sallam, Muhammad Sallam set, erected up a special tent inside of Medina, knowing that all these people were coming. And he assigned certain Sahabi to take responsibilities for these groups, look after them, feed them. Your guests are coming. We want to show a good impression. Now, Muhammad Sallam was very intelligent in the way he done this because he set up the tent where they would stay inside the masjid so that they can view when the people would come to do salah. And remember, in virtually after every salah, Muhammad Sallam will be giving a khutbah, he'll be giving a bayan, he'll be teaching them things so they could listen to this and they could pick it up. So some of these delegations, when they came, they would come for a week, some for two weeks, some for three months, for four months, and they would learn quite intensively. So when Muhammad Sallam gave responsibility to the Sahabis, he would say, stay with them and teach them and talk to them and converse with them about Islam. So when, Abdul, when Banu Abdul Qais came to Muhammad Sallam, they said, oh, you're Rasul. When we came here, we came at a time that where we live and where you live, there is a piece of land. And there is a tribe called the Banu Al-Mundir. And we are at war with them. And we wanted to get to you much earlier, but we can only come to you when the, when the, when the sacred months come. Because when the sacred months come, they can't get to fight. So they're not allowed to. So when the sacred months come, then we have come to see you because Al-Mundir can't attack us. That's the only way we can get through their valley to come to see you. So Muhammad Sallam was very pleased. And they said to him, Muhammad Sallam, can you tell us something that we can take away with us back to our people and learn about Islam? And so this is what Muhammad Sallam had said to the uh, Banu Abdul Qais. So this is where the concept of the five pillars of Islam came, where actually there's only four now at the moment. So Muhammad Sallam said to him, in this case, there are four that I will teach you that you must implement and four that you must prevent, you must keep away from. So the first thing he said is that the shahada, ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu wa muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. Now this he explained very carefully to them, because when he said, when you take the shahada, the shahada isn't on par with the other pillars. It's actually the first pillar and the other sit underneath it. Because the testimony to Allah, which you should all understand, when you give a shahada, shahada means that you are giving an oath to Allah where you are submitting yourself to him and everything that he has sent down. And that's why Muhammad Sallam is within that shahada because what he sent down was through Muhammad Sallam. So every time you break or abandon a law of Islam, you are destroying that oath. And there's a huge amount of accountability to that oath. So when it comes to the shahada, this is something that people should take very, very seriously. Then he went on to say, you should perform your salah, your prayers, and then you should give zakat, and then you should fast for Ramadan. So there were four. Hajj wasn't in here because Hajj wasn't made obligatory yet. Hajj was made obligatory after this time. Then he said to them, there are four things which I restrict from you. And he said, the first one is al-Dubba, then al-Nakir, then al-Hatam, 
and then al Musafa. Now, what's interesting about this are these are all different types of alcohol. What these actually are, there are actually different vessels that are made, that are used to make alcohol. So you use a particular type of vessel to make like brandy. You make a type to make whiskey, etc. And he knew that these people, alcohol was a huge thing in the Arabian Peninsula. So he clearly defined the different types of alcohol that are produced from these vessels and he forbid these. Okay, so he actually literally forbid them. So they understood. So they learned this and they adopted and they became Muslims and they took this away with them. Now, alongside with them, there was a man by the name of Ashaj, who was Ashaj from the uh, Abdul Qais tribe. So the story wanted to say that when they arrived, they, they had with them an old uncle, Baba, that had, was them, who was inflicted with some illness, mental illness, or, or what they would, some had these say that he maybe been possessed. And Al, uh, sorry, uh, Al Ashaj was part of this tribe and he came and he parked his camel. And when he came on, now they took a long journey. It's like if you take a very, very long journey, you're going to a wedding, you don't put your jacket on, you hook it up at the back, and then you put it because you, obviously your clothes get creased up. Same thing would happen to them. They take a very long journey and they would bring their new clothes. So Al Shajaj, when he came, he had two pieces of white clothing with him, which he would put on as a respect to Muhammad Sallam. So as the delegations came, so this is the attitude because they heard so much about Muhammad Sallam as they parked up a whole bunch of them, some came running to him, some came walking to him. al Shajaj was at the end who parked up all the camels and then he made his way to Muhammad Salam. When Muhammad Salam saw him walking, he said to him, he said, he said, this man has two qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves so much and, and the Prophet loves so much. al Shajaj said, what are these two qualities that you see in me? He says, your ability to judge fairly and your perseverance. These are two qualities that Allah loves dearly. Allah Ashaj was very clever and he said to Muhammad Sallam, are these qualities something that I built and developed or is this something that was gifted to me by Allah? So you know when you see people and they have certain good qualities, we know we brag, I'm like this, I'm like this, I'm like this. And Muhammad Sallam immediately said to Allah Shajaj, this is what Allah has brought you to. He didn't say Allah gifted it. He said he brought you to this. Which means that we can all develop these qualities. If Allah feel, feels it's befitting upon, he can bring this. So people who say to me, oh, I've got a problem. I don't have no patience. I'm always getting angry. I'm always doing this, that, whatever. You have to go through a process before Allah gifts this to you or brings you to these qualities to give you sabr. To, to give you ability to keep perseverance. Perseverance is very good because perseverance is one of those things like we were talking the other day about Ramadan and how difficult it is to keep consistency up through Ramadan. The first five, six, seven days are brilliant. We're on supercharge. And then when you get to eight, nine, 10, it just starts to taper off. You get tired, you get, you know, you, you, you get complacent, you know, you start to give up, you stop going to the tarawih and so forth. Perseverance is about pushing yourself beyond your limits. And that's a great quality to have because once you've got that, nothing will be able to stop you. So this is one of the things that, you know, Muhammad Sallam said to, uh, to Al-Ashaj about this. And then he became so happy with this. He said, uh, you know, praises to Allah, the fact that he has brought me to these qualities and the fact that the Prophet Muhammad and Allah both love this in me. And this is, I praise Allah for giving me this quality that they admire me for this, having this. And then Al-Wazi with the man that I brought, he said to Muhammad that look, we brought in a man who's inflicted with something and Muhammad bring him to me. And so when he bought him and they put new clothing on him as well, but the man was like, you know, he wasn't with it mentally. So Muhammad said, lift up his shirt top so I can see his armpit. And then he slapped his back and he made a dua for him. And immediately the man's illness or whatever he had disappeared. Now we know Muhammad Sallam performed many of these karamats, many of these. And this was something that was gifted. Now this is not something that happens now. The karamat that happens now is when Allah SWT allows things to happen. We, we don't see them, but anything that 
happens that we seem to be miraculous it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Muhammad sallam was given the permission to do all these things because he needed the edge. He needed that edge where people can believe that he is a prophet in a time like this. You know why? Because what was what was ripe in those days was people were all involved in witchcraft. People were all involved in doing sorcery. People involved in calling in jinns and doing all sort of magics and stuff like this. So the fact that Muhammad Sallallahu was able to do this and say this does not come from a jinn, this does not come from shayateen, this comes from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's showing that actually all these things that you've been doing doesn't necessarily come from the shayateen or from your magic. It comes from the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we go on to another story, which is another delegation that came. And this story about, is about a man by the name of Thumama bin Uthal. Muhammad Sallam at, at one stage sent uh, an army to the southern part of Arabia, where, where, it's, where, it's, where we are, Yemen now, effectively. So it's, it's going further south. Whilst on that journey, now remember, Muhammad Sallam was constantly on the defense and the offense as much as possible. He knew that people were planning to attack him. They wanted to destroy the Muslims. They knew the Muslims had a lot of wealth. Imagine that Muhammad Sallam now has taken Khaybar, he's beaten the Jews, he has so much wealth. They wanted to take control over him. So they were always doing a very covert operations against him. So he would hear about this. He would have scouts everywhere. So he would send out the army to different places, effectively call it his own internal police force, his, 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 his secret agents. So they would go out. So at one time they went and they caught this man called Thumama bin Afal, who was from the southern tribe of uh, Najd. So he was actually from the Banu Hanifa tribe. Now, if you remember in the very early stages, when Muhammad Sallam used to give Dawah in Makkah, he, when, he, when the pilgrimage used to come, he, all these different tribes were there. And he would go into their tents and he would sit with them very politely, very calmly, giving them Dawah, teaching them about Islam. Some were very good to him, but would not accept Islam. 90% of them would not accept Islam because it was like a new thing. They know nothing about him, but they would have mannerisms that, that would be contrary to dealing with Muhammad Sallam. But some of them were absolutely rude disgustingly rude to Muhammad Sallam and Banu Hanifa was one of those tribes where if you remember where you know when he came in to give dawah they became very angry with him he said okay fine I'll, I'll leave and as he was leaving he, when he'd gone to his camel one of them hit the camel so hard it threw Muhammad Sallam off literally threw him off and injured himself he, he suffered from a concussion so they were from this particular tribe so when they caught this man and they arrested him, they brought him into the masjid, and they tied him to the pillar of the masjid. And they left him there. So this man is tied up, and he's looking, and he's seeing Muslims coming and praying, and going in and out, and so forth. He's looking at their behavior manner. Now, Muslims didn't torture him, they didn't beat him, they fed him, right? And they tied him up until Muhammad Sallam came. When Muhammad came to see him, he said to this man, Thumama, he says, so what do you think now? He says, I'll tell you what I think. He said, if you kill me, then you all you would have done is killed a man that has killed others. But if you release me, let me go, then you would release a person who will be very grateful to what you have done for him. Yeah, the favor that you've done. Okay, because at the end of the day, he's saying that you probably have the right to kill me because I'm just a killer anyway. But if you release me, then that's a big thing, right? For me, it's a big thing that you've done and I'll be very grateful to you. So then Muhammad says, Salah, and if you need money, I'm happy to give you money. So Muhammad just smiled at him and walked away. He came back the second day, Muhammad says, Salah, to him, and he says, so, to Mama, what do you think? He said, exactly what I said yesterday. If you release me, I'll be very grateful. And if it's money you need, I can give that to you. Muhammad then went. But Muhammad has been very clever. He's leaving him a day. To, he wants him to see what's going on around him, this Muslim community. This Medina community was not like any other community. You understand? You go from here to, I don't know, if you, I don't know if you work in the, Harun's worked in the city, a few people, you walk, you, walk, you walk in the summer after five, six o'clock, after you finish your work. Everywhere you go, pubs, rowdiness, drunk, swearing, people throwing stuff, whatever, behaving like that, even a football, yeah? That's the image you get of this community. But if you walk into a masjid on Eid or during Ramadan and you see the behavior and the manners of the Muslims and the way they should be, that would appeal to you more. Be shocking. So the norms of that society was if you go into anywhere, they were getting drunk, 
you know, because you got to remember, like Mecca, before Islam was there, they had nightclub scenes, they had prostitution, they had, uh, you, you know, people cheating, people getting drunk, there were fights, there were duels, there was everything, right? Everything goes on. And you were like thinking, what jungly place have I turned up to? So he's turned up here and he's seeing calmness, people talking about good. So once we left in there, third day he comes back and he says to Mama, so what do you think? Now he thinks he's talking about what do you think about your situation? He's saying, what do you think about what you've seen? So when the mama says to Master Salam that if you let me go, then I'll be grateful, Master says, let him release him. So mama then leaves, runs over to there's so there's some palm trees, and that's where they do wudu. He goes over there, he performs a wudu because he's been watching him do it. He performs a wudu and he comes back to Master Salam and he takes a shahada. He said to Muhammad Sallam, until this day, before this, you were the most hated man to me. Because all the Banu Hanifa hated him. Even though he's the most loving, compassionate person, there's no reason to hate him. It's because of what he stood for. He said, and today you're the most beloved person. From what I have seen, the way that people are with you, I've seen something of you that, I, that what people told me about, what I thought I had depicted of you something different. How many people you go non-Muslims and what they ask them, just nine out of 10, if you, you, you grab a non-Muslim, ask them, what do you think about Muslims? And they would have a very negative view, right? Until they become your friend. Until they see how you treat them, how you behave with them. They're like, that's not what I thought of Muslims to be like. You understand? They completely change their view, and that happens. This is why, understand what Muhammad Sallam did here is exactly what we should be doing with the non-Muslims. When it comes to Ramadan, when it comes to Eid, when it comes to just general compassion, help, assistance, we show more. And the reason why, because for us, there's no real monetary sacrifice. For us, it's for whatever Allah gives us and we'll do what we can. We believe rizq comes from Allah. Somebody needs help. We do it. And you give them the chance to see it rather than what the media wants to portray. So this is what happened. The media was portraying something different. Then he said to him that your people were the most hated to me. And today, in the last three days of what I saw, they're the most beloved. The way we used to treat you, he goes, if that was that was us capturing yours, we would have kneecapped him, we would have tortured him and killed him and then sent him back for ransom. But they fed me, fed me with better food that they were eating. You know, because that's how they done it. In Battle of Badr, if you remember, they took the prisoners of war, they fed the prisoners better food, right? Musab bin Umayr's brother uh, said that they fed me the better food, they took the, the cheaper food and gave me the better food and I was a prisoner. Then he said, this city, Medina, was the most hated to me because of what I felt you represented, right? But now it's the most beloved. He said, Ya Rasul, he said, when your people caught me, captured me, I was actually on my way to do Umrah. What do you think? Muhammad said, then you should go and fulfill your rights. So, so Mama goes to Makkah. When he arrives in Makkah, now, this obviously happened before Fatah Makkah because Makkah is a hostile territory. When he arrives there, rumor got out that this guy, Thumama, and people know him very well because he's a, he's a, he's a representative of his delegation, of oh, sorry, uh, representative of his tribe. So when he enters, the people hear news and they say to him, what's this that we heard that you become, follow the religion of the Sabians? That's a derogatory remark against the Muslims, right? You follow the religion of the Sabians. He goes, no. Nope. He goes, I follow the religion of Islam. And just for your stupid comment, he said, from now on, not one single grain of wheat will be traded with Makkah. And all the, the majority of that trade came from there until the Prophet Muhammad gives permission. They hated that. Now they're thinking, now this guy's got control of this area. They're not even going to trade with us. So just from this, and Muhammad didn't teach him to say this is the love and the compassion people had and the commitment that they, that they gave Muhammad Sallam once they embraced Islam. This story, is, I don't know if you've heard this one, but this is, this is a quite key one. Um, and people talk about it in, 
as um, as one of the signs of the jal and, and the signs of the day judgment. There was a tribe that came to see Muhammad Sallam, and this tribe was actually again a tribe from the Yemen area, um, and they were still part. Actually, they were still part of the Banu Hanifa tribe. Because Banu Hanifa is a very very massive big tribe, so they were a subsection of this tribe. Interestingly enough, when this tribe came to see Muhammad Sallam, along with them came a man by the name of Musaylimah. Yeah, so everyone knows who Musaylimah. If you don't know who Musaylimah is, Musaylimah is the false prophet which Muhammad Sallam had a dream about and this would this would explain to you how this whole Musaylima issue came about Musaylima actually died just to give you a little bit of history so Musaylima went on and set up his his version of Islam and claimed that he was a prophet had a big following from the Banu Hanifa and was actually killed in the time of uh, Hazrat Umar bin Al-Khattab and he was executed at the age of 100. He was 150 years old when he got executed. Okay, so just imagine like the, the damage he was doing. There are a few different narrations about how this happened. So Musail Imam was very much involved in magic. He would have a, you know, like a bottle, like a booze bottle that was made. And he could actually take a fresh egg and push it through the neck of a bottle without breaking it. He would be able to do tricks like take a dove, a live dove, pull off its wing and reattach it. And gazelles that were on the mountains, wild gazelles, you just can't tame them. He would call the gazelles down and drink milk from them. So people were very impressed by his ability. So when this tribe came to see Mahansa Salam, they, they kept Musaylima back alongside with the baggages. That, that's normally what happens if you come, there's, you always leave one person looking after the baggages. So they came to see Muhammad Sallam to talk about the deen and Islam and so forth. So when they spoke, um, Muhammad Sallam started giving them dawah and they decided that they wanted to embrace Islam. Now, when the delegations come, Muhammad Sallam always gives them gifts, right? He's always in the habit of giving them gifts as a... It's not a bribe, but it's a way of enticing them more in towards Islam and just showing love and compassion. And they said to Muhammad Sallam, oh, but we have one man who's also looking after our baggages, yeah, who's with us. So Muhammad Sallam said, in that case, uh, his status is no worse than yours, right? So give this to him. So when these people went back and they baggage back up and went, and Musa Lamar said, what happened? He said, yeah, we talked to him, we talked about Islam and so forth. And we mentioned you as well. And he said that your companion is no worse than you. So they all left. They took Musa Lamar with them. And when they reached Yamama, with, with the area that they were, immediately this man, Musa Lamar, he apostatized. And he started to say that the prophet has said to you that I am no less, which means I have partnership with him in prophethood. Okay, so he started talking about this. Um, and he said, and he wanted to say that, look, I've been made partners in this matter. And he, then he told his delegation that with him, did he not say to you his status is no worse than yours? And the only reason he said this was from his knowledge that I have been made partner in this matter of prophethood and religion. Thereafter, he got so carried away in this and he started pushing out, he started making up verses, making out light that they were from the Quran. And he would say things like, God had bestowed his favor on the pregnant woman. He has extracted her from her being that moves from between the skin of her womb and her intestines. Now, you know the eye of the Quran that talks about, I create a man from a gushing fluid issue from the Lord. He's now mimicking, making his own versions up. Okay, so he's adding in all this stuff. Then he said, though Muhammad has forbidden fornication and drinking alcohol, I allow drinking alcohol and fornication. So people who were not strong in this Islam Right? We're like, oh, this is quite a better religion. If I can do all of this stuff, even better. Um, and nevertheless, he testified, and he testified the messenger of God um, being a prophet, 
but he also made claim that he was in equal partnership in terms of his prophethood. Now, during the time of Hamza Salam as well, there was also a man by the name of Al Rahal bin Unfua. Okay, now Al Rahal was a companion of the Prophet. There was many companions of the Prophet. One day, this man Al Rahal was sitting with Abu Huraira. Okay, they were learning and so forth. Muhammad Sallam walks past them, and he sees both of them, and he stops. He receives an indication, a revelation from Angel Jibril. And he looks at them, he says, one of you, your mola, meaning your head, is in hellfire. Now, this caused great anxiety. And he said, it, your, he goes, your mola, meaning your head, will be in hellfire like the size of Mount Uhud. So this create great anxiety for two, both of them. Like, what is he talking about? Who? Who is he on about? Then eventually, the inevitable happened, and Al-Rahal had apostatized. So he joined now Musaylima. So obviously Abu Huraira was relieved that it wasn't him. And he, the eyes and the versions that he memorized, he would then claim these to be that Musaylima. Because obviously people wouldn't know, right? If you're not moving around, he could just say these ayahs, Musaylima received. So he would teach Musaylima, say these, and say that these are your ayahs that have come down. Eventually, Al-Rahal was killed by Zayd bin Al-Khattab in the Battle of Yamama when they went to attack them. But it went on this, that Musaylima eventually also, as he grew his following and so forth, he also had he also married a woman by the name of Saja. You probably heard of her. Okay. So Saja was she was also a source, she was a witch, basically. She was involved in black magic and so forth. And he was married to her. And they joined forces, There's a whole big story about it. They joined big forces, right? To, to get a lot more following and it caused a lot of fitna in this. Um, what was interesting with was when Muhammad Salam, in, in another narration, when he met Musaylima, Musaylima said to him that, look, you know, what are you going to offer me? And when Muhammad Salam came to see him, he had a stick with him. He said, I will not even offer you this stick. Now this man, there's a Sahabi with him. He goes, this is such and such. Any questions you have, you ask him. Basically, I'm not talking to you. Later on, Muhammad Sallam declared to the Sahabi, he said, they said, what happened? Why did you react that way? He said, I had a dream. And in my dream, there was two gold bangles in my hand or something of gold jewelry. And I blew at it and they disappeared. This is the, this is a, I believe this to be the two imposters. And there were, there were several imposters that came and Musaylima was one of them. They made it, and Sajjah was the second one who claimed that she was a female prophet as well. And they married together to join their forces. And eventually Musaylima got killed. And if you remember, uh, very, very far back, uh, Wasi, who killed, um, you know, um, his uncle, Abu Ham uh, sorry, uh, Hazrat Hamza, he redeemed himself. He felt like he redeemed himself because he took that same spear and he killed Musaylima in that battle. And said, I feel like if there's anything I can do back from Hamza Salam for killing his uncle Hamza, that I would get relief from, from doing such a thing. Where Sajjah eventually became a good Muslim woman. She converted. So it just shows you, you can go in the, in, in the depths of darkness. There is always opportunity to turn back. Right? Doors are never closed until death comes to you. Right? So never write anybody off. Always give people the opportunity. Remember Abu Jahal was so deep into... His, his, uh, his fight against Muhammad Sallam, and yet Muhammad Sallam made dua for him, or one of the Umrs, he said, Ya Allah, make one of them follow me. Yeah, at least give me, not give both, give me one of them, right? So Umar Khattab at that time was also, um, you know, not, um, uh, you, you know, following Muhammad Sallam. And the last one, if I just get an opportunity to do this, is the uh, delegation of the Najran. So this is an interesting story. So Najran was the northern part of Arabia. This is where all the Christian Arabs lived. So Mansa son wrote a letter and he sent it off to the bishop there. So the bishop, he read this letter, and in that letter, um, in that letter, what Mansa son said, in the name of Allah, in the name of God, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very clever the way he did this, right? Because they're Christians and they follow Ibrahim, who had the son, Isaac, and Yaqub. From Muhammad, the prophet of the message of God, to the bishop of Najran, are you peaceable? I praise to you the God of Abraham, 
Isaac and Jacob to proceed. I summon you to the worship of Allah away from the worship, worshiping the servants of God because he used to worship Jesus thinking that he was God. And if you should refuse, then you will have to pay the jizya. And if you refuse, I'm warning you of warfare. So when he read this letter, the first thing he had done was he called in some aides. There was one man by the name of Sharabil, who was a very strong politician, delegation person that he had. And he said, read this letter, what do you think? He goes, look, I'm not a man of God, right? Or I don't follow, I'm not a monk and bishop like you guys. But looking at this, doesn't our scriptures mention him? I mean, why would you ignore this man? So the bishop says, okay, fine, sit down. I'm going to get a few more opinions. So... He then calls upon another man by the name of Abdullah bin Sharabil. He calls him and says, read this letter, what's your view? He said the same thing as Sharabil had done. He said, okay, sit down. And then he calls another man by the name of Jabbar bin Faid. And he says, what's your view? He says, it's exactly what, and he said the same thing. Because he didn't know what the other two have said. He said, it's exactly the same thing they said. He said, okay. So then what happened was the bishop, they have this, they have monastery, they have a big alarm system, right? They light up the lanterns, they... They, they take off their hair cloth and they raise it up in their, in their monasteries as an alarm. It's like, it's like an alarm system for the whole emergency. Everybody come, come, big town hall, we're gathering up. And they spoke about what happened, that the Zeta came. There is indication about such a man in our scriptures. So they all agreed that we should send these three with a delegation to go see Mahamsa Salam. So... Remember, this village that they lived in was huge, right? It takes a day to walk through it. How long would it take if you went from Langley all the way to Burnham? It would take you, what, if you're walking, it'd probably take a few hours, right? It would take a day's journey. It's quite a big town. 73 villages, 100,000 warriors. It's a big place, right? So he's, in his mind, he's thinking, well, you know, what are they going to do? We're a powerful state, right? But anyway, let's, let's entertain this. We'll send them through. So they go there to see Muhammad Salam. Now, when they arrive, because they're a very, very super rich nation, they come in their very silky robes and they all have the, the literally gold ring in each, in each finger. So when they came to see Muhammad Salam, they come into the, into the masjid, Muhammad Salam sees them and he ignores them. Second day, ignores them. Third day, they're like, why? We've come all this way. He's the one who sent the letter. Why is he ignoring? So they go to see some of the Sahabi, Hazrat Uthman, Hazrat Ali were there and so forth. Hazrat Ali advised him and said, listen, Take these robes off, yeah. Go put on some your monastery, like your humble clothes, yeah, and come and take these rings off. Then, when they did that, Muhammad saw them, and then Muhammad said, Now I'll talk to you. Because the reason I didn't talk to you before, because Shaitan was with you, Shaitan was sitting with you, and I would not converse with him, right? Because this, this bravado that you guys come with. So they sit down, they start debating, they start having a conversation about Jesus, Isa bin Maryam, and so forth. And Muhammad Sallam says to them, I don't have anything to say about him today, but I'll come back tomorrow with an answer. And this is where the eye of the Quran, this is why I say the Quran is very important because each one of these eyes have a story behind them. And this eye in Surah Al-Imran was released or revealed to Muhammad Sallam. And this is what he said to them. He said, God considers Jesus to be like Adam. Because what they said to him, this is interesting. They said, why do you say that Jesus yeah, is a slave of God? Yeah, that We find that very offensive. You name us any man that's like Jesus doesn't have a father. Right? Come on. Name us any other man. So I'll come back tomorrow. This is Allah's answer. God considers Jesus to be the like of Adam. Adam didn't have a father. And guess what? Jesus had a mother. Adam didn't have a mother either. How's that for an answer? And this shocked them. He created him from earth, then said to him, be, and he was. The truth is from your Lord, and so do not be of those who make disputes. To those who could dispute with you, after the knowledge that has come to you, say to them, come, let us call our sons and you your sons. We are wives and you are wives and we ourselves and yourselves. And then let us make our appeals to God and pray that God places his curse upon them. Ah, so what's he doing? So Allah is saying, I'll give you the answer, but there is a little practice that they do to see who's the truth. And this, is, this, this whole practice is called the practice of Mu'lana. And what this means is they used to, they, so Allah said to Muhammad Sallam, call them, bring all their 
close aides and everyone, you bring your family and what you do, you invoke curses on each other against their beliefs. And whoever is wrong, Allah is going to curse them. So, Muhammad let's go, let's have this, this curse battle because Allah, this is mentioned in the Quran. This is the way it says, bring your family, bring your wife. So they do this. So Shuhabir, who's there with them, the leader, he says, this is a bad idea because I am fairly convinced he's a prophet because it's in the scriptures. If we go and we do, the, we kick off this fight, this cursing, we're going to lose and we will be cursed. So Shuhabir goes to Muhammad Sallam and he says, look, we don't want to do this. We submit to you whatever you, whatever you suggest. So Muhammad Sallam says, okay, fine. So Muhammad Sallam writes this letter for him and he says, in the name of God, the most merciful, the most beneficial, this is written by Muhammad the prophet, the untutored or the unlettered messenger of God to the city of Najran. It is his judgment regarding all their produce and all their assets in gold and silver and slaves to be generous to them and to leave them all this in consideration of payment. So we're not going to take, we're not going to take war, we're not going to enslave them and take you as slaves. We're going to let you allow, keep them in consider, consideration of a payment of 2,000 sets of garments a year. Of these, 1,000 shall be paid each Rajab and another 1,000 each Safar. He then went on to give the rest of the conditions and then a document ends witnessed by so forth. What is that? That's jizya. We're not going to touch you. You practice your religion because it's el You're just going to pay the jizya. That's it. So they agreed. So they went all the way back to the bishop and they said to the bishop that this is what's happened. The bishop is riding. The bishop's name is Al-Harith and he's with his, sorry, uh, he's with his brother called Bishar. And he says, to, they came back with the letter and he said, what do you think of the letter? Now, Bishar was like, this letter seems kind of genuine. I think we need to go and see him. And immediately his brother, the bishop, takes his horse and blocks him from going. And he says to him, understand from me that, because what he has said to him was um, the delegation that the letter of the messenger that came um, he said to him, you might have spoken, because what happened was when the letter came, when they were riding, Bishar, the brother, he slipped, the horse slipped, and he said something on the lines of curse Muhammad, right? And Bishar, the, sorry, the, the, the bishop, returns and says to his brother, be careful because you might have spoken a curse against a prophet who has been sent. He may be a prophet. His brother realized and thought, you know what, you might be right. So therefore, I'm going to go and see him. And he stopped him because everybody was watching. And then he said to him quietly, he goes, understand from me, brother, that I only said that so that the Arabs have, that who reported this, who've just come back, right? That when they, when they hear me saying this, fearing that they may consider that we had accepted his authenticity or being swayed by his voice or agreed to something that this man wanted to which the Arabs did not comply, even though we are the most powerful and numerous of all. Meaning, look, I only said that just to appease them that we're, we're talking about. Bishar said, you're, you're mad. I'm going to see him. His brother went all the way to Medina to apologize to Muhammad Sallam and then took the Shahada. And since then, never, he never went back and stayed with Muhammad Sallam. So the impact of this dawah and the delegations that the Muhammad Sallam is sending. And what was interesting about all of this was it's so huge that the most interesting thing about it is there is this underlying concept when you if you give dawah and you have knowledge and you understand it well when you talk to a rational individual he can deny it as much as he wants in your face but the truth will always submerge you understand so remember one thing truth will always resonate in people it is the ignorance that will prevent them from accepting it Abu Jahl was the same, right? He absolutely believed Muhammad was a prophet. He said, but I'm not going to give up my power for him and his family. Many of these people would not give up their, their, their positions. And you have these situations with the non-Muslims that are around you, the kuffar that are around you. They know that what you speak is the truth, but you have to do yourself a favor first. For God's sake, don't have knowledge. You have an obligation. Why do you understand now why Muhammad made seeking knowledge as a continuous obligation? We learn a little bit and we think we're going to start, you know, chucking a few eyes here and there and 
some verses that Ahmed Yadad spoke about, you know, to the Christians and we're going to win them over. It doesn't work that way. You have to understand your own religion because two things will happen. One, when you understand your religion, you will reinvite yourself back into the deen. You will learn something new and you will, you will reignite your relationship with Allah. Secondly, you're so concrete on that knowledge. When you teach it or when you debate and you discuss with people, they will understand what you're saying and they will be convinced. Let them then go away. You don't worry about whether they change or not. Allah said to Muhammad it is not your job to change the hearts of the people. It is but my job. I will decide whether they change or not. But one thing is for sure, truth cannot be denied, even by the most ignorant. Jazakallah